A middle school teacher from Queens accused of raping a 14-year-old student after teaching kids about what consent means. Welcome back to Sidebar here on Law and Crime. I'm Anjanette Levy. Melissa Rockenzies taught at the Corona Arts and Sciences Academy in Queens, New York. Rockenzies faces charges of rape, criminal sexual act, and acting in a manner injurious to a child younger than 17. The Queens District Attorney's Office says Rockenzies was one of the accuser's summer school teachers between July and August of last year, and that beginning in July, Rockenzies and the student started having conversations about sex on social media. Then in September of last year, the DA says Rockenzies and the student started a sexual relationship during meetups in her car near the school. Queens DA Melinda Katz issued the following statement. These disturbing allegations represent an abuse of authority and a betrayal of the trust students and parents place in their schools. On behalf of the victim and his family, and the overwhelming majority of teachers committed to the education and well-being of our children, we will seek to achieve justice in this case. Rackenzie's husband told the New York Post his wife is innocent, he loves her, and she's the mother of their three children. Joining me to discuss this case and the allegations surrounding it is Lynn Cadigan of the Cadigan Law Firm. She has represented victims of sexual abuse, uh, including victims of Archdiocese of the Catholic Church, and she is here to talk with us today. Lynn, welcome to Sidebar. Thanks for coming on. Um, I'm happy to have, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Lynn, we have a 33-year-old teacher, Melissa Rackenzies, and she's accused of raping a 14-year-old student. What is your first impression of this case? Although we don't know the facts of this case yet, there could be more facts to come out. I find it very surprising that a woman, particularly a younger woman, is sexually abusing one of her students. It's normally um, men who are doing this. It's very unusual to have a woman. And one of the strangest things about this is the fact that There's some Facebook post floating around out there in which she was teaching children about consent and what consent means and whether or not they might be approached by some, a family member or somebody like that, or, you know, victimized by a family member. And she's teaching these things. And yet now she's accused uh, of violating that very tenant of what consent means. And she's an adult. She's in a position of power over a 14-year-old student. She's old enough to be this student's mother. It, it's very instructive for school administrators to realize that someone who can be a fox in sheep's clothing, because it frequently, what happens frequently is the molesters or the abusers appear to be the ones who are the good guys or the good women or the ones who are in charge and are watching out for the kids. You don't have sexual abusers who appear creepy or appear like they might abuse. What you have is abusers who take advantage of the system, blend in and act like they're helping. So it's it's very instructive for schools and other places that take care of children to realize that the teacher, the aide, the administrator who appears to be the most helpful and the most concerned about the children are frequently the ones who are actually abusing the children. She has been reassigned, as they say. Um, So she has not been terminated and she's a teacher. So of course she's in the teacher's union. Uh, There are ways in which these things are handled. There are things laid out in contracts about how allegations against a teacher are handled. They, They don't usually just immediately fire them unless there's been some history of it somewhere else. Uh, So what does reassigned mean? We've we've heard many times about the rubber rooms in New York City. It's kind of like, you know, this place where they send teachers who are under scrutiny or have some situation like this. Uh, So she's still collecting a paycheck and, and she's innocent until proven guilty. Because this is the United States, you are innocent until proven guilty. So what the school is trying to do is protect her rights against the rights of the child to obtain justice. And frequently what they do is they give these teachers administrative positions. What they should do is put them in a position where they have no access to children. However, if she's out on bail, she can meet this kid in a parking lot in a car like she was accused of doing originally. 
if a sexual abuser is out on bail or out on the streets, you can't stop them from what they're going to do. And so it, it's a real problem. Um, unfortunately, there is not a national network for schools to know who's been accused and who hasn't. And so they can't give notice to each other, which is something that really should be put in place. And how would we put something like that in place? Because we have seen cases in the past in which a teacher is accused of sexual abuse, sexual assault, uh, something to this effect, and they simply resign and move to another school district and the behavior continues. So how do we implement something uh, such as what you're suggesting? For all we know, this woman could get off. She could escape any criminal penalties, just quit and leave because there might not be enough evidence to convict her. And she could go on to the next school. And there should be some sort of national network that has a list of teachers who have been accused. Now, they ask teachers in their application, have you ever been accused? But if you are an abuser, you're going to lie. So it should be something akin to the fingerprint system but it should um, involve all the reports to the police as well, in my opinion. Now, some people think that's violating their constitutional rights because they haven't been convicted. But I think when you balance the needs to protect children against her constitutional right to not have it be known she was wrongfully accused, I think the benefit for the children should outweigh her rights. You said at the beginning of our talk here that women, you don't see that as much, female teachers accused of these types of things. Is it because we just think of this as mostly being something involving men? Is this more prevalent than we realize because maybe people don't notice it as much with female teachers? I, I still think it's very unusual. It's very unusual. Um, but I think it's a bit more prevalent now because the students are coming forward because of the very thing she was teaching. This very victim of hers was being taught by her to come forward. So it's, it's an interesting twist in which the victim is now using the very tool she gave him to bring her to justice. However, it is very unusual for women to do this. Um, in my 38 years, I've only seen it twice. Um, you know, and it's generally being a sexual predator is a male. If you're representing the parents of the 14 year old, um, what's your advice to them? Is, is, is this ripe for a civil suit or what, what do you think about that? Well, frequently in these situations, you almost um, obtain more justice by bringing a lawsuit against the school for failing to have notice of what she was doing. What the, what the student is going to have to prove is that the school had notice that she was being alone with him, that she had the opportunity to be alone and that she was inappropriate. If they have that notice, they can bring an action, the parents of the child can bring an action against the school and they can obtain a money judgment against the school. Frequently, there's more justice obtained by suing civilly than bringing a criminal case because bringing a criminal case requires such a high burden of proof and is much more stressful on the child. Anyway, well, that's We it. will continue to follow this case and see where it goes. Lynn Cadigan, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. That's it for this edition of Law & Crime Sidebar Podcast. You can download and listen to Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, you can always watch it on Law & Crime's YouTube channel anytime. Just remember to hit that subscribe button. I'm Anjanette Levy, and we will see you next time.